Welcome to tonight's event, Katha Pollitt on Pro Reclaiming Abortion Rights. I'm Terry Gordon, Director of the Gender Studies Program at the New School. It is an honor to introduce this event. It has been 40 years since Roe versus Wade, yet abortion continues to be a highly contested political site. Pro is a groundbreaking work because it reframes the terms of the debate. In the introduction to her, her collection of essays, Reasonable Creatures, Paulette writes, for me to be a feminist is to answer the question, are women human with a yes? It's not about whether women are better than, worse than, or identical with men. It's about justice, fairness, and access to the broad range of human experience. It's about women having intrinsic value as persons. In Pro, Paulette develops this line of thought by placing the question of the personhood of women at the center of the abortion debate. Tonight's event will be structured as a conversation between Katha Paulet and Irene Carmon. And just a few words about our participants. Katha Paulet is a poet, essayist, and columnist for the nation, a cultural critic and feminist icon. She is known for her wit, her insight, her humor, and perhaps most importantly, her courage to speak up and speak out about deeply important ethical, cultural, and political issues. She is the author of two collections of poetry, three collected volumes of critical essays, including most recently, Virginity or Death, and a collection of personal essays. She has won numerous awards, including the National Book Critics Circle Award for her first collection of poems, an Arctic Traveler, and two National Magazine Awards for essays and criticism. Irene Carmon is a national reporter at msnbc.com, where she covers women, politics, and culture. She is currently a visiting fellow at Yale Law School's Program for the Study of Reproductive Justice. In 2011, she was named one of Forbes 30 Under 30 in Media, and she was featured in New York Magazine as a face of young feminism. She has written for many newspapers and magazines, including the Jerusalem Post, the Village Voice, and the New York Times, and she has received numerous awards for her reporting. In an NBC, MSNBC piece that came out today, uh, the piece was entitled, A Mixed Election for Reproductive Rights. I would like to thank all the people who have made this event possible, Many thanks to James Meter and Madeline Gobo from Picador USA, to Peter Rothberg from The Nation Magazine, and to Taya Kitman from The Nation Institute. Special thanks as well to Laura Arricchio, Dean of the School of Undergraduate Studies at the New School for Public Engagement, and Pamela Tillis, Director of Public Programs at the New School for Public Engagement. So I'd like to welcome Katha Pollitt and Irene Carmel. Pro is um, a book that was, uh, it's a kind of book that to win arguments with your uncle at Thanksgiving, which is right, right coming up, so uh, be sure to pick up a copy. I wrote the book in the hope that people would read it who were sort of on the fence, what I call the muddled middle, which is a phrase invented by Roger Rosenblatt. Um, and uh, I don't know, I think maybe the muddled middle is... Uh, is uh, muddling off about something else now. But I mean, I think most books are written for the people who already kind of agree with you. So um, that's OK, too, because I feel that I'm giving uh, people some, thing, some arguments that uh, I haven't read too often. Um, and one of them is, comes at the end of the book where I talk about motherhood, that we think of abortion and motherhood as the opposite of each other, but really, they are on a, they're part of the same thing, which is the whole span of a woman's reproductive life. And when you think that 60% of women who have abortions are already mothers, which I think most people don't realize, then out the door go the stereotypes about, you know, it's just young sluts in New York and... Um, uh, cold, evil career women who hate children. 
Um, it's women who have children that are having abortions because they want to do right by their children. They have a lot of responsibilities and often not much money um, because 40% of women who have abortions are poor. Um, so um, anyway, so at uh, the end of the book I talk about motherhood and in a chapter called Reframing Motherhood. So I'll just read a little bit of it. Okay. People think of pregnant women as weak and vulnerable. But when I was pregnant with my daughter, I felt as if I could put my hand in fire and it would only glow. I never felt alone. There were two of us right there. I didn't think of my child as an embryo or a fetus, medical words that belonged in a textbook or an abortion debate. I thought of her first as a funny little sea creature of indeterminate sex, and later, yes, as a baby, even though she was only a baby in my thoughts. Like many couples, her father and I even had a pet name for her, Winky. This is so embarrassing to my daughter. <laughs> I wasn't a mother yet, but I was preparing to be one long before she was born. Waiting for the amnio tests to come back, I spent a lot of time wondering what genetic anomalies, as we are taught to call them, because defects sound so judgmental, I could live with. That is, the baby could live with. Blind, fine, deaf, fine. But what about blind and deaf? Down syndrome, fragile X, Turner syndrome. As it turned out, I was lucky. The tests showed nothing abnormal, and I did not have to decide. I did not even know about the most disastrous possibilities, anencephaly, or organs growing outside the body like some strangling vine. Today, if I'd gotten test results like that and lived in a state that bans abortion after 20 weeks, I might have to travel to a distant state. I would be able to afford it, but what about the women who can't? What happens to them? Do they have to carry their doomed winky until it dies inside them or go through childbirth for the sake of life? We think we value mothers in America, but we don't. We may revere motherhood, the hazy abstraction, the cream of wheat with a halo ideal, but a mother is just a kind of woman, after all, and women are trouble and not so valuable. Low-income mothers drag down the country. Why'd they have kids if they couldn't support them? Middle-class mothers are boring frumps. Elite ones are obsessed sanctimommies. Don't they know how annoying they are with their yoga, their cat fights over diapers and breastfeeding? Their designer strollers that take up half the sidewalk so that people with important places to go have to take several extra steps. Motherhood is interesting to the larger culture to the extent that it can be turned into a sexual fantasy, the MILF, or as a way to set women against one another, or to make judgments about them, or as a rationale to limit women's ability to do anything else, or as a way to manufacture that debilitating fog of guilt and anxiety that saps so many women's vitality and confidence. But in itself, taking care of children is not of great interest to the world at large. The work of mothers is so unvalued that a judge in Nebraska, previously a lawyer for Operation Rescue, can deny a 16-year-old in foster care the abortion she wants on the grounds that she isn't mature enough to choose abortion. But apparently she is mature enough to go through pregnancy and childbirth and raise a child. Anybody can do that. Aristotle thought a woman was a deformed man. Something had gone wrong in conception. Perhaps the south wind was blowing instead of the more vigorous north. And although we may not believe in women's inferiority consciously anymore, the burden is on the woman if she wishes to participate fully in life, which has been organized around the ideal of the male worker without significant responsibilities at home. The burden is also on her if she has children, voluntarily or not, and if she doesn't have children, because what kind of woman doesn't have children? Also, if she has sex, voluntarily or not, she is the one who has to use contraception and use it right or pay the price for its failure. Are men held up to public scorn for fumbling the condom or not withdrawing in time, or for that matter, assuming that his partner has taken care of birth control already? She is the stupid one, the careless one, the one who forgot for two minutes how easily her body could betray her. It is as if a woman lugs her reproductive system around with her like a fur coat in July. She can't be expected to move about freely like a normal person in that hot, bulky garment. But she could take it off, couldn't she, if she really wanted to. Under these conditions, the ability to end a pregnancy is deeper than a right. It is basic self-preservation. 
Maybe there could be a society in which women were legally compelled to bear every child they conceived and yet did not find themselves thereby hampered, impoverished, trapped into a hated partner, consigned to a lesser life. But that society would look nothing like the one abortion opponents want to bring about, which is basically a more retrograde version of our own, with women tied for decades to raising children as dependent wives or struggling single mothers. <clears throat> to, um, okay, then I'm going to skip ahead a little bit because um, I just have to tell you these little quotes. Okay, um, so I talk about, you know, the social value of motherhood and how uh, we don't really uh, un acknowledge it. In fact, it is so obscured that in 2009, Senator John Kyle, Republican of Arizona, tried to strike pregnancy and childbirth from the list of conditions employers had to include in their health plans under the Affordable Care Act. I don't need maternity care, Kyle argued. I think your mom probably did, <laughs> Senator Debbie Stabenow, Democrat of Michigan, tartly required. But Kyle continued, so requiring that on my insurance policy is something that I don't need and will make the policy more expensive. The Harvard economist Greg Mankio also objects to the community rating of maternity care. The goal is to spread the risk of childbirth among the larger community, he wrote on his blog. But having children is more a choice than a random act of nature. People who drive a new Porsche pay more for car insurance than those who drive an old Chevy. We consider that fair because which car you drive is a choice. Why isn't having children viewed the same way? Leaving aside the fact that not all childbearing is so voluntary, is a baby like a luxury car? The social value of Porsches is very low. If nobody bought them, the world would go on much the same. But children are immensely important to everyone, including people who don't have any or want any. They have value both as the children they are, giving meaning and purpose and joy to many people, and employment to lots of people, and as the adults they become. They are the future, after all. If women stopped having babies, the human race would end. And Mankiw would have no students in his EC 101 class. <laughs> and if women stop raising babies to adulthood, usually quite competently despite the cost to themselves and without anything remotely like enough support from the community whose costs Mankiw is so worried about, who would do that work? Mankiw tri trivializes motherhood as a socially useless individual choice. Abortion opponents who glorify motherhood in the abstract trivialize it more subtly by making it a question of no choice, one size fits all biological fate. They deny its physical risks, its social and economic costs, and its enormous personal consequences. They disregard the individual circumstances and inner life of the pregnant woman. They equate the value of a grown woman with that of a zygote. They entwine childbearing with the very different issues of chastity and sexual continence and use the threat of pregnancy to enforce their own reproductive, repressive sexual mores. But whether a baby is a free personal choice or what you get for being a slut or God's beautiful gift to rape victims, the practical result is the same. Whatever difficulties motherhood entails are the problems of individual women. To a far greater degree than most other Western nations, we have decided that women should individually bear most of the consequences of becoming a parent. The sexual puritanism of conservative Christianity meets the conservative libertarianism of Greg Mankiw. Why should I pay for your birth control or your abortion or your baby? Get a husband. The results are all around us in the highest rates by far of teen pregnancy and teen childbearing in the West, struggling single mothers, downwardly mobile families, child poverty. That this is degrading to women is obvious, but it is also degrading to motherhood. It turns what should be a source of strength and power and recognition into something that renders women weak and dependent, blocks them from full participation in life, undermines their economic standing, and leaves too many poor in old age, if not before. Perhaps that is the point. When you consider the way restrictions on abortion go hand in hand with cutbacks in social programs and stymied gender equality, it is hard not to suspect that the aim is to put women and children back under male control by making it impossible for them to survive without it. Thanks. It's a huge privilege and honor for me to be on this stage with you, Katha, because I've admired your writing as long as I've known about it, which is 
I believe I emailed you in high school asking if I could spend career day with you. So it's been. I feel so old. <laughs> it's, it, you were distinguished. And, uh, and one of the things that I love so much about your writing is the way you have this unassailable logic, but at the same time, you're an incredibly beautiful stylist. So thank you oh, so thank much you. for sharing that with us. Well, thank you for being here. It's, it's a little daunting because you actually know what you're talking about. <laughs> I know you know what you're talking about. Um, I, I just want to take a pulse of the room. Um, raise your hand if you're depressed by the elections last night. Yeah, I'm really happy to be back in New York. Um, <laughs> it's, uh, I, just, I just got back from Kentucky um, two hours ago. So, Katha, since you are a clarion of, of logic and unsentimental at the same time that you're passionate, how should we feel about last night? I don't know, I'm going to go home and drink a bowl of poison soups. <laughs> That's the wrong person to ask. I think, you know, it's, it's in, in a way, the Democrats did what uh, we feminists and have been saying all along, which is don't run away from the issue of reproductive rights, championing it. Um, don't run away from issues like pay equity, champion it. But they did it all wrong. Um, for example, I was reading um, uh, Mark Udall, uh, his response to a question about, you know, what about really late abortions? This was the incumbent senator in he Colorado. Was, who, who lost, lost, who lost right. it to a very, very terrible Republican. Oh, I'll tell you about in a minute. Um, <laughs> so Mark Udall gave an, a let, an answer that was so abstract. It was like when Dukakis was asked, remember, when he was asked, you know, what would you do if your wife was raped and murdered? You know, would you be for the death penalty then? And he gave this very abstract, technocratic answer. And Mark Udall basically just said, look, it's between a woman and her doctor. Um, but why didn't he say, you know, we all find these very, very late abortions very disturbing. And that's why it's really great that they hardly ever happen. Um, you know, an eight-month abortion, please. You know, if, it, if someone's getting an abortion at eight months, there's a, there's a catastrophe going on. And what, would you ha what, what do you think should happen, Mr foolish person who's asking me this question. You know, but, and then I realized the reason he gives this can canned answer is because really he doesn't know enough about abortion. He doesn't have a personal, it's something some uh, consultant told him to mm -hmm. do. Um, and of course it came out sounding uh, not genuine and not from the heart. Um, and I think especially for the low information voter, what comes from the heart is what really counts. What, you know, if they like you, so they didn't like him. They instead chose to like Cory Gardner, who was for the personhood amendment in, in Colorado until he kind of backed off. When he, so you, yeah. have, you have a really great chapter where you kind of focus on the claims of the personhood movement. Could you sort of take us through what's wrong with the logic of this is a ballot measure. It failed in Colorado yesterday for the right. third time. Yes, and in North Dakota too, where it had been passed by the state legislature, but it had to be ratified um, by the electorate, and they, they didn't. Um, personhood amendments have never won, even in Mississippi, can you say what personhood amendments are? Yeah, are? personhood amendments basically says um, that uh, it's a human being at every stage of development and um, you know, has to be protected. Um, and they never win, but people keep putting them up for some reason. I, I would be interesting to know why you think they do that. I mean, they think they're going to get lucky someday. But, um, uh, in, I have a whole chapter about the issue of personhood, which um, my critics on the pro-choice, pro-life side really disapprove of. But basically, um, if you believe that a fertilized egg, an unimplanted fertilized egg, is a baby and is equivalent to a 40-year-old in terms of its, its personal rights, its right to life and all like that, you, you can't be in favor of abortion for rape. That's just as much a human being as a baby conceived any other way. You can't be in favor of preserving the health of the mother. I mean, I'm not allowed to take your kidney. Um, I, you know, if, if my health is going to go because I'm having a baby, too bad for me. Um, and in countries where the 
pro-life, anti-abortion. You know, I went through this whole thing. I took a pro-life out of every page in this book. And I have an explanation of why I do that. But as an organized movement, I, I do call it the pro-life movement because that's their name. Um, but uh, um, sorry, so I no, lost my no train of thought. For they make you, no exceptions, whereas most people would make it. They want to see. That's the thing. Americans want to make exceptions, uh, which is sometimes called rape, incest, and me. <laughs> that's when abortion should be legal when I want one. Um, but uh, but not you, just me. Um, but uh, they want to make exceptions when it, it isn't the woman's fault, when the woman has been involuntarily made pregnant, or, or when it's a serious, ma serious medical matter of her life or health or the, the uh, unborn fetus's life or health. Where the support falls off is when it's for the reasons that 90% of women who have abortions have them, which is economic, social, personal, I want to finish school, I need to keep this job, I don't have a place to live. I have all the kids I, I can handle right now. Um, I don't have a partner. They have no sympathy. Americans have very little, so they, you know, they go on and on and on about how much they hate single mothers. But if you say, I, I want an abortion because I don't want to be a single mother, too bad, you know? Um, so it's basically well, it about women and to, sex. Yeah, it just comes, I mean, it I, just comes down to it you just have comes sex. Down to you don't have sex. Don't have sex. Or the wrong kind of sex. Yeah. No, you should have the wrong kind of sex because then you won't get pregnant. But um. <laughs> well, I, I guess I mean like maritally sanctioned. Yeah, you can afford it. Right to have right. a baby. Right, and um, you know the fact that I was I was on the radio in Minnesota and uh, with a an, an anti-choice lawyer, Catholic lawyer, and uh, of course it was Minnesota, so everyone was very nice, you know. But she really hated me. <laughs> I didn't like her much either, but uh, <laughs> so, to tell you the truth. But so, so, almost the first thing she said, it wasn't about personhood or anything like that, almost the first thing she said was, women have abortions because they lack self-restraint. <laughs> and so it's right to the sexual issue. It's, and, and that's where you see that a lot of it is about, they talk about personhood, because that's the only argument they have left that they can make officially. They can't say, basically we think people should only have sex in marriage when they want to have children. They can't say that. Um, they can't say, well, you know, women probably shouldn't aim so high with education and work and all like that. They should be having babies at home. Um, they can't say that either. There's no sympathy for that in the official statement in the culture. So they have to drag out all this theology of personhood stuff. Um, and then people start thinking, well, it's kind of a baby, yeah, okay. Well, in some ways, I think uh, what happened in this election cycle, there was no moment where somebody said women have to have self-restraint, right? Yeah. Nobody was actually that honest. I mean, we talked about Colorado. Cory Gardner basically backed off from his personhood thing, and he seemed like kind of a nice guy. It's clear that people really didn't believe that he was so extreme. Uh, the same thing happened in Iowa. Joni Ernst, pro-personhood Republican, won over a pro-choice Democrat. Um, these are sort of purpley states, but there's still mm -hmm. kind of this, I, I feel like maybe what happened also is that there's a disconnect where people don't really believe that abortion is at risk, or they think maybe there's too much abortion. And so in your yeah. book, you're making kind of an affirmative argument about abortion being a social good. Yes. Right? So if you're sitting in a room with that person, I mean, what do you say to them? I would say, well, you know, what do we want here? We want children to be born when their parents can take care of them. We want people to have a life that is not uh, such a terrible struggle that it drives people into great misery. We want women to develop themselves and get their education and get jobs. And we want men to be fathers when they're ready to, because men are an important piece of this story, aren't they? Um, and this is good for society. It's good for everyone um, that children not be born in this random fashion. Um, and uh, I would say that. I would say, wouldn't, wouldn't you be for that? Mm -hmm. And yet, birth control isn't perfect. People aren't perfect. Um, there are a lot of people that don't get good reproductive health care and don't get good sex education, you know, I mean, because the same people that are against abortion are also against sex education. They're not so keen on birth control either. Um, and so wouldn't it be better, I would say, if we just had a society where um, all the born people could had a shot at some being useful and productive and a little bit happy. That's what I would say. 
And they would say, you know, you're so right. <laughs> Why didn't what they should have done is handed out copies of Pro. I think so. All in yes. the swing states. Yes. And then we would have a very different morning. We'd be sitting here celebrating oh, and drinking so martinis. Yeah. Um, so part of your book is really aimed at pro-choice people. You know, we started out a little bit talking about the Democrats' message. And, you know, a lot of people for years, most famously Bill Clinton, have been using this phrase, safe, legal, and rare. Yeah. And it implies a lot of things in it. And I think your book is kind of a, an effective rejoinder to what's limited about that. But so what's wrong with saying safe, legal, and rare? Well, it depends on what you mean. If you mean rare because everybody's using great birth control and being very respectful of their partner and all like that, um, fine. But that's not the other, it carries the idea that there's too much abortion now, but we don't know that that's true. That's why I prefer safe, legal, and available because there are a lot of people who want abortions, women in desperately poor and terrible circumstances, and because of things like the Hyde Amendment, which bars uh, federal and in many states, state, state versions bar um, Medicaid uh, payment for abortions for poor women. So there are a lot of people that would, would love to have an abortion and they can't get one. Um, so I think that to put the accent on how many abortions there are is the wrong place. And it can only make abortion seem more stigmatized. Um, whereas I think it would be better if people just destigmatize it, do what they need to do, have whatever feelings they have about it, and we just all move on to something else. You know, I, I know what I wanted to ask you to ask me, um, <laughs> if I can do that. Uh, well, yes. you know, something that is really fascinating to me that I've been noticing more and more is the way feelings, the emotions of women play such an important part in discussing abortion. I don't, I'm wondering if there is any other issue where feelings are so important. It just seems like to me like, oh, I regret it. And then that becomes very serious. State legislators say, oh, well, we have to slow this down because women might regret it. Uh, Anthony Kennedy in the Carhartt decision said, well, we've got to get rid of partial birth abortion because a woman might regret it. Um, and, and then I'm thinking, OK, you might regret it. People regret things. Life is tough. Um, you might have done the same thing if you were back then again, and even though you might know you'd regret it later because you have to do what you have to do. You might not regret it, but why does it matter? Um, you know, it's just like divorce. Divorce, some people win in divorce and they're happier. Some people are sadder. Some people think it's a great thing at the time, and 10 years later, they think, oh, I wish Joe was back. You know, I miss Joe. Um, but well, we don't make the law about divorce on the basis of people's feeling. We make it on the basis of what is good public policy. And that's the only thing we think about. And I don't see why abortion is like that. I think it's because it's about women, and it's all about blaming women. And so then women have to produce certain kinds of feelings. Um, or say, you know, speak about it in a certain way, and then it comes to be like some big reality show. Um, and I think that's just such a wrong way to look at this issue. I mean, the only thing I would add is that some of the folks who want to ban abortion also want to make it harder to get divorced. But it, it, yeah, that will never go anywhere. <laughs> yeah, there might be actually a, a pro-divorce constituency in a way that people have been unable to rally for the pro-choice. The policy. day state legislators say, OK, we're going to make it harder to get divorced. It's the day that none of them are married. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, I guess you need an opt-out clause. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I do think it's, it's, it's a way to betray a kind of phony concern for how the woman feels. Mm -hmm. Because otherwise, the anti-abortion movement has no explanation for the fact that so many women want abortions. Right? There has to be like, later you're going to change your mind. You're this intemperate, emotional woman, or you were tricked by the doctor. I mean, there has to be. Uh, a kind of accounting without seeming to villainize the woman. And I, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about the fact that, you know, people don't realize how incredibly common abortion is. You have a great part in your book about this. Well, you know, there, uh, that's really true. One in three women has, or three in ten, more, uh, more accurate, women will have at least one abortion by menopause, and many will have more than one. Um, but they don't generally talk about it. And so people think, oh, I don't know any of these sluts who do this. Um, I would they, never do this. I would never do this. And neither would my circle of you know, good people. We don't do this kind of thing. 
Um, but they're, they're probably wrong. They probably do know women who've had abortions, because that's a lot of people. And when you think of all the people who help that woman, you know, you think of the boyfriend, the friend who drives her to the clinic, the mother who makes the appointment for her daughter, and so on and so forth. It's a lot of people. Um, and um, I think that uh, if people knew that they knew women who had abortions, some of the some of the stereotypes would fade away. They would see, well, it isn't just a, you know a teenage slut. It's my coworker, or it's my it's my aunt. In my case, it was my mother. Um, a lot, and you know, since I wrote that, a lot of people say, oh, my mother had abortions, and my aunt, and my sister. And it's it is so common, and uh, I think that the more people can talk about that with their friends, the better we will be. I mean, I, I was astonished. Somebody uh, that I know from a work context who just saw me talking about this just one day decided to tell me their abortion story. And you just think, how many people uh, are holding this inside of them? And they're yes. not telling. Yes. Even though it's so omnipresent in our political conversation, um, it feels like maybe in the last few years, due to some activism, um, due to some cultural moments. I don't know if anyone here saw the movie Obvious Child, but I recommend checking it out. It, it, to me, it feels like there might be something changing about that storytelling. I'm wondering if you think that's happening, and if so, why? And, and is it happening the right way? Well, I think it is happening. There are a number of websites, for example. Um, Not Alone is one, and uh, One in Three is another, where women tell their abortion stories. Um, and uh, then there have been things that were very shocking to a lot of people, but I think uh, were good interventions, where Emily Letts, for example, videoed her abortion. And you know, that and put that, it on YouTube. Yeah, and put it on YouTube. And you know, what was good about that was that I think a lot of people think, oh my god, an abortion, you know, they go in there with a pair of scissors and they cut up the baby and um, you know, you almost die and all like that. And she just showed that a first trimester abortion is a, takes like five minutes and she was fine and the clinic was nice and clean and it didn't have a lot of evil people hovering over um, like Rosemary's baby or something like that. <laughs> um, and, and I think that, you know, that was, that was very good. That was a very educational video. Um, and then uh, somebody tweeted their abortion. Um, and there's a group called Sea Change, this, this newish group that your sister-in-law is all involved with. And they've done something very interesting, which is they've put together a, a, a book, a, a short book of abortion stories. And the idea is to get women, like in book clubs, to read it and talk about it. I think that's really fantastic. Um, because I think that's where, that's where the change has to come from. We can all talk about this forever, but if people are all locked inside themselves and saying, okay, I did it, but it was the worst, it was so shameful, and no one can know, then you're very politically disempowered, um, you know? And somebody like Emily Letts, though, I mean, it, it, there's a, it costs a lot to tell these stories. Totally. So there's a reason, she got incredible backlash, yes. terrifying backlash. I mean, it does not come without its consequences if only one or two people hold themselves up that way. It, t terribly, because also because she said that she hadn't been, she hadn't used contraception, and that's how she got pregnant. And then fur really flew. And she was um, smiling at the end, and people saw that as sort of proof of her villainy. Yes. Um, so there is a cost. There is a cost, and she was very brave to do that. But maybe something like the Sea Change book. Shout out mm -hmm. to Steph Harold, my sister-in-law. Um, if there's a critical mass, each person is less vulnerable. Yes. And it has to start from somewhere. And the first people are, are going to be demonized and villainized, as you say. But as more and more people stand up and say, well, you know, Emily Letts. I mean, you know, I, was, I wanted to write this piece, which is, who has not had a pregnancy scare? Raise your hand. <laughs> you know, who <laughs> Anyone? Has, you know, what man and what woman have religiously used contraception perfectly every time they had sex? I think that is a small number. I hear from those people because they say, I use birth control and I have never been pregnant. And so people who get pregnant have not used birth control and that's so it's all their fault. Um, it's not that hard. Um, and uh, in fact, one woman is really funny. She wrote to me and she said, well, I'm a Catholic 
um, and I don't approve of abortion. So I decided I would be very, uh, you know, serious about using birth control. I'm thinking, hello, <laughs> Miss Catholic Catholicism, you know. So then she goes on about how it isn't that hard to use birth control. I'm thinking, wait a minute, you know, it's sort of like, um, okay, so you're a Catholic, you do what you want, and then you blame other people. Um, that's not that's not the way you should be. I don't think Jesus would have been that way. <laughs> well, maybe the problem is is that people always have this sort of perfect version of themselves. Yes, and it's so it's so the anti-abortion side provides such moral resolution, resoluteness. It says this is murder, right? right? I mean, it has all these other side messages, but it comes down to the like every life is sacred, is a very simple mantra, you know. So what? Yes. It, and and the pro-choice side at times is very complicated. It's messy. It's yeah. people making mistakes. I mean, I feel like your book really helps distill it to a clear message. If, if you had to distill it to a very clear message, what, what would you say? Um, I would say um, we want a society where children are wanted and well-raised and where women get to be all they can be and men too. And that cannot happen if women have to bear every fertilized egg. Um, it just, it never has, and it never will. And if you look back before, I'm reading Jonathan Igg's book about uh, the invention of the pill. And my God, you know, the way women used to live was really, it was, that was what you were here for. You were here to reproduce. And it was, they were very open about, people, the culture was very open about saying that. And we don't think that anymore. So, and that's good. <laughs> um, thinking about the future, uh, in which reproductive rights are very much unquestionably going to be in peril. Yeah. After yesterday, uh, you know, the composition of the Supreme Court was already a kind of looming issue in terms of the uh, elderly status of two of the pro-choice votes and anything could happen. Mm -hmm. A lot depends on 2016. So we're looking at a pretty unstable reality looking forward. And I'm wondering, a few years ago you heard a lot, young women don't care, they uh -huh. take it for granted. Uh, for you, I'm, I'm curious, since you uh, are, are so good at kind of jumping into conversations that other folks are, are kind of holding themselves back from, you get in the mix on the internet and so on, what, what are your thoughts about kind of the generational issues when it comes to this issue? Well, it is a little funny, you know, that uh, the, a lot of the people who are the most gung-ho about pro-choice issues are beyond the age of conception. <laughs> Sometimes I do think, I said, why do I care about this so much? You take, you take it over. You know, you're the ones, you're the ones that are going to get pregnant. But I think that, uh, I think um, there are a lot of young women who are waking up. I mean, there are so many young women activists, um, and so, and a lot of it is happening on the internet. And I think, you know, older people think, well, it's just happening on the internet, but. It's happening on the internet. They they don't un necessarily understand the role that the internet now plays in in organizing. Um, and I think you know websites like Jezebel, um, you know, where just you can just see they take it so much for granted that abortion rights and reproductive rights generally are just part of their birthright. There's just no discussion, of, uh, no question about that. And I just have to believe, and I want to know what you think that. When, when it gets close to home, you know, uh, the loss of abortion rights, we're going to see people uh, getting more active about it. Uh, it's, it's, you know, it's a, such a big country and it's so red and blue. And, you know, in New York, you can get an abortion very easily. And in Wyoming, they don't even have an abortion clinic, but Wyoming, you know, you could read the New York Times for a year and there wouldn't be any stories about Wyoming. It's, it seems so far away. Um, so I think, you know, now we're seeing clinics are closing in, in purple states like Pennsylvania, uh, in Virginia, formerly purple North Carolina, um, and Ohio. These are big states. Um, and, and I think that it's going to, people are going to take notice. Right, on some level I think there's also a chicken little problem yeah. that people have, mm -hmm. which is this law is going to be the one that devastates everything. This law is going to be it, this politician. And I actually think, you know, the sky is falling yeah. in places like Texas, mm -hmm. where you had 40% of the clinics have already closed. It was going to be down to eight. The Supreme Court finally stepped in. And yet yesterday, white women voted against Wendy Davis, voted for 
Greg Abbott. Mm -hmm. There definitely seems to be, in yesterday's vote, a sort of racial breakdown where white women in particular were not pro-choice yeah. voters. Whatever motivated them, they were not voting for the pro-choice candidate, and they weren't always voting for the pro-choice woman. Mm -hmm. um, what, to what extent does, does that kind of worry you, or, or that you could also argue maybe more folks should have turned out who were directly affected by this? So kind of looking at mm -hmm. the political picture moving forward, you know, what is to be done? Well, I read today that something like one third of the Republican voters in Texas who voted for Greg Abbott are pro-choice. So what that says is that they're not single issue voters. Something else is more important, like really screwing those immigrants or you know, <laughs> uh, something like that. Um, and one thing that's very interesting is that, uh, that anti-choice voters are much more likely to be single issue voters. They are really motivated um, because they're, first of all, they, have, they think they have God on their side. That's always gets people you know, active, and also they're, they're fighting what they feel is the status quo, whereas our side is living with the status quo. Um, and so we are always in the position of saying, oh, chicken little, you know, sky is falling, and then it doesn't quite fall, and people say, oh, there they go again. Where, but the other side is just thinking, we have to save those babies. We have to stop the moral decay of America. This is just so terrible. So they are single-issue voters, but we are not single-issue voters. So that gives them a tremendous advantage um, because that's all they care about. Um, yeah. So, so one more question before yeah. we turn it to yeah. the audience. Um, for folks, folks who showed up here obviously care enough about this issue to be here, but they may not be full-time activists on the issue where they may want to get more involved because they are genuinely worried about the trends that they see uh -huh. nationwide. So what can they do? Oh, there's so much you can do. Um, you know, you can... Um, get involved with the, uh, with a local abortion fund like NIAF and raise money for um, poor women's abortions. That's really important. There's an organization called Haven that takes into, where members take into their homes women who come to New York for abortions. I mean, they still do that, like before, before Roe, um, and some are too poor to get a hotel room. NIAF um, is uh, the New York Abortion Access yeah, sorry, Fund. Yeah, sorry, yeah, New York Abortion Access Fund. Um, you can, I think, I think, write, I, just, I do think, you know, don't write our congressmen, because they're all very pro-choice. Write some <laughs> other congressmen. You know? uh, write those bad congressmen. Um, get, in, get involved in, in politics, and, you know, just write, if you, you just, if you just write a letter to a newspaper or to a website, those things are read. Um, if you make yourself a presence on the internet or even on Twitter, um, these, we have to make more noise, I think. More, we have to make ourselves look big. Um, I will close by saying that on the internet I saw today to comfort me, um, it was a porcupine fending off a lot of lionesses. I don't know, maybe some of you saw this. And the porcupine makes itself really big. And, and the lionesses are just saying, oh, what is this? You know? And eventually the porcupine is sort of going up to them and saying, look, look at my quills, <laughs> leave me alone. And, and they walk away. <laughs> it was really cute. And I think you know, that porcupine had the right idea. You have to make yourself look big and you have to be assertive. And then the lions will flee. Uh, let, let's hope. Um, so I think we all have to be more porcupine-like um, and just be more out there not take, and not take our freedoms for granted. Thank you so much, Katha. Thank you, Erin. Great. Well, I'm going to start with this one. And this one is about the idea that abortion is murder and mm -hmm. how that's very contingent on your religious affiliation. It's so true. I'm so glad that you raised that question because you know there is not one word in the Bible about abortion. So anti-choice people have to make a uh, sort of poetic... Uh, literary criticism of the lines that they would like to have say <laughs> There's that. There's an exegesis. Right. For example, apparently the one, the big one is uh, when God says of, I believe, Jeremiah, before, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. In other words, you existed before you existed. And how that means there's no abortion, I don't know. Um, but anyway, but the big important thing is not every religion is against abortion. Um, most mainstream Protestant denominations 
are not against abortion. And you know who wrote the Bible? Jews wrote the Bible. And in, and in yeah, Erin. Erin herself. Personally. <laughs> she was very important. People, a lot of people don't know that. She, <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> Jews wrote the Bible. And in Judaism, correct me if I'm wrong, Erin, you become a person when you take your first breath. Um, before that, you have value. It's not like you can have one of those mythical day before birth abortions, but you're not a person. You're not a person. And um, the, the religion that says you are a person is the Catholic Church. And that's really kind of it. Although now, interestingly, the Southern Baptists and some of the evangelical fundamentalist churches are saying the same thing. But here's a fun fact. At the end of the 60s, when Americans were beginning to talk about maybe we should liberalize our very rigid anti-abortion rules, a number of denominations said, yes, you should do that. And one of them was the Southern Baptists. So the Bible hasn't changed. They've changed. Well, and another thing that I think is really instructive is for folks who aren't aware of how other countries approach this issue, I wonder if you could put that into context about what's specific about how the US has particular issues around abortion? Well, I think, I think it is because of religion. I think that's where the home base of the anti-choice movement is. That's where the money is. That's where the muscle is. That's where the organizing takes place. Um, I go every year to the Right to Life march around the anniversary of Roe v. Wade. It's 95% of those people are Catholics, very proud Catholics. And 5% are evangelicals. And then there were two Jews standing on the sidelines. <laughs> <laughs> it was really, really something. But in Europe, religion plays much less role in political life. Um, France is an openly anti-clerical country. Um, in Scandinavia, religion is a very small thing. It's a national marker of national pride or something like that. Germany is the same. And all these countries have more restrictions on paper, as Ross Dufat is always reminding the world, than America does. But the difference is, you can get an abortion paid for in the National Health. You can get it. It's widely available in France. You can get one in any hospital. Um, it's you much, can get the morning after pill in a high school. Yeah. So in middle school. Yeah. So it's it's just a whole different way of and, and everybody's hooked up to public health there. So it's not like here where it's it can be quite hard to find to stay current with your birth control. Um, so they don't. They have a much more rational way of dealing with this. Yeah, we're somewhere on a spectrum. It's an El Salvador I would consider kind of a, an exemplar of the most difficult regime for women, where women are prosecuted if they are suspected of having an abortion. And then, you know, when I go home to Israel, uh, my home country, folks will say to me, they don't understand what it is I cover. They don't understand why this is such a heated issue yes. here. Yes, yes. And so, yes, religion, culture, all big part of that. We have some incredible questions. Thank you, everyone. This one I'm just going to read. Could you elaborate on the larger economic objectives at play that may be influencing the public's acceptance of abortion with regards to labor force production and the economic value of women? Wow. <laughs> so I, I take this to mean that the public is uneasy about abortion, in part because I think if I'm understanding, it, that they're, they're, because women have do all this unpaid labor around ch child care. And also, there are more workers being produced that are probably going to be low-wage workers. I mean, that's potential. I think well, that's what I'm reading into this Well, you question. know, it's a funny thing, because um, I have heard both, yeah, um, they, um, anti-choicers oppose abortion because they want there to be a lot of surplus labor or because uh, they want there to be a more uh, upper income white people, um, which was never going to happen because of the uh, ban on abortion. It didn't happen 100 years ago or 150 years ago, and it's not going to happen now. Um, I really think that, uh, and I want to know what you think, Erin, because you have uh, interviewed a lot of anti-abortion people. I think it. They are not thinking that way. I think, you know, like Henry Hyde was asked, um, well, here you are passing this uh, Medicaid, Medicaid ban, um, and that will only affect poor women. It will only affect women, in fact, who are so poor they don't have $500, that you have to be really poor. Um, and you can't even borrow it from your friends. 
um, isn't that unfair? And he said, oh, well, I would love to prevent everybody from having an abortion, but these are the only people I can get to. And I think it's a religious thing. It's that every baby is a baby, and you save the ones you can. And I don't think they're thinking about who's going to get a job in 20 years or, or what women are going to be doing. I think it's, it's, it's religion. I think there is the piece of it where they want to push women back. I do think, I do think that's part of it. Um, yeah, I mean, I think when it comes to activists' intent, I, I certainly agree that, that they sincerely seem to believe that, that, that you know, this is the greatest genocide in history. The folks that I've interviewed who devote their life to this, they, they're true believers. But in terms of other people going along with it, I think at least the effect, and I'm not sure about the intent, but the effect is to create a semi-permanent underclass, for better or for worse, folks who are you know, living in the Rio Grande Valley and already really struggling. Mm -hmm. And they are cheap labor for folks at the top. They, uh, women's mobility is hampered by the, the yes. people who are being forced to carry unwanted pregnancies to term are, you know, they're, they're part of the economy. They're taking care of the future workers. They're holding down the fort at home. They're taking minimum wage jobs. So I don't know if this is all according to plan, but I think given the distribution of who can access abortion, uh, mm -hmm. in, including in Latin America, I think it functions to kind of fuel the low wage labor force. And, and I'm not sure, and it, it seems pretty certain that there's an unmet need that, that that there are lots of folks there that if they could access abortion, they would. Mm -hmm. And as we know, there are also folks who are crossing the border. Yes. Um, I went to a pharmacy in Mexico where you can very, I went to six in a row where all of them give you a different dosage for the, the pill to, so scary. to induce yeah. an abortion. And they tell you different gestational limits. Uh, it's actually only really safe up to eight to 12 weeks, but you know, the, there's, there is an illegal abortion market that's happening. So I think, um, that is probably the upper edge, and the other mm -hmm. people are just kind of getting by. Mm -hmm. Okay, here's a great question. How would you respond to arguments about men, in this case the partner, not having a say in abortion choices, while at the same time we are demanding that they become actively involved in childcare? Is that a contradiction? I don't think it is, um, because until the child is born, it is in the body of the mother, and she is... Uh, enduring the rigors of pregnancy, which can be quite considerable. She is um, going through childbirth. She could die. It, he is not undergoing any of that. Um, and so I think that that choice has to be hers. It was interesting because usually that question is, you know, why shouldn't he have a say when he has to pay child support? Um, and then, and what I say to that is, we can talk about child support, but not as part of the abortion discussion. It's really a, a whole different issue. But you know, the other thing is, is look, if there are two people involved, and one wants to have an abortion and the other doesn't want to have an abortion or, or to have an abortion, somebody has to win that argument. Um, it can't be both. You can't half have a baby, um, and so it has to be her. Um, he is perfectly entitled to say, I will stay home, I will do everything, I will, here, here's $100,000. Um, he can do anything he wants to persuade her to have that baby, but in the end, it has to be her decision. All right. If we did live in a society in which pregnant women did get all the social and economic support they need, paid family leave or mandated, there was no consequence at work for having a family, and anti-choicers supported this world, does that change your philosophical position? No, it doesn't. Um, I, I, there's was, I actually deal with that whole thing in, in the book, so I hope you'll um, read that. Um, no, because if you take, take a country, countries like the, those in Scandinavia, they do a lot for families there. France does a lot for families. Um, even Canada does more for families than we do. I shouldn't say even Canada. Canada <laughs> does, yeah. does more does more than we do. But having a baby is not just a matter of, you know, oh, here's some daycare. Um, it's a full, it's your whole life. There is no way that the government can raise your child, really. It has to be you. And you, if you don't want a baby for whatever reason, like maybe you're too young, maybe you don't want to be with that man, maybe you have a lot of children already, whatever it is, um, I don't think that any, I, there is no society where that would make no difference at all. I often think, though, that if the pro, 
life, movement, was serious. They would say, "Here, here's a hundred thousand dollars. Have a baby." You know, I mean, there is probably an well, amount. Well, they say, of, "Here's some diapers. Have a baby." That, that's what they say. Here's some, here's some secondhand baby clothes. Have a baby. Um, but there's probably an amount of money that would get some women to say, "Okay, now I'll do it." But they don't do that. Um, they don't say, "Oh, here, I'll build you a house." <laughs> you know. But I think that uh, I think that motherhood is very complicated and it's very demanding and. It really should be voluntary. That's the bottom line. It should be voluntary. So I'm going to combine these two questions to close this out. Um, we touched on this a little bit, but I'm sure there's more to say. But the first one is, during the AIDS crisis, ACT UP was vigilant in their protest and strategy around dissent. And they changed the term or terms around HIV AIDS activism. Do you think that a key part of the abortion rights movement, especially at a time where the stakes are so high, is protest and dissent? And uh, this comes from a volunteer patient, escort, and activist. Other than donating money to clinics and candidates who support reproductive rights, what can an NYC resident do to support abortion access in places such as the Texas Rio Grande Valley? So you touch on that a little bit, but maybe let's get in more towards the posture. Should, should everybody be more confrontational? Should yeah, there be I more think, protests, like ACT UP? I think, um, I think ACT UP was great, and it did really change a lot of things. And I've sometimes thought, like, you know these crisis pregnancy centers that are so full of lies, and they come and pick at our, our clinics. Why don't we pick at them? You know, why don't, or just nicely, stand outside, <laughs> the, stand, stand outside the crisis pregnancy center and say, you know, if you go in, this is not a clinic, they want you to think it's a clinic, but it's not. There are no doctors there. They are going to tell you a lot of lies. Don't go there. Um, I think that we could have a sort of on the ground level of activism that would, where we would be more visible um, and that would actually be helpful. Um, the second part of the question, what can we do with the Rio Grande, about the Rio Grande Valley? Well, there are abortion funds that help people and there are people that are actively in Texas working on this, um, and um, you can get in touch with them and see what you can do. Um, maybe you could have a house party and raise some money for the Lilith Fund, or um, there's one called, um, oh, what is it the called? The T Fund. The T Fund is another TEA. Um, Fund Texas Women. Fund Texas Women. That's Fund Texas right. Choice. Now it's called Fund Texas Choice. Um, and uh, they help with transportation and hotels for women coming from uh, other parts of parts of Texas that don't have clinics. Um, I think that there is a lot that that we can all do. Um, it's a little hard here in New York. Texas is far away, but Texas is coming closer to us. Yeah, and there's it's a lot of folks closer. on the ground who need support. Yes, it's um, not it's not a wasteland out there. There are folks who are helping out, yes. and they, if you want to support them, they're there. Well, that's the other thing I just want to say about all these um, red states. You know, even the reddest states. 40%, 44% of people vote Democrat. Um, so it's not like it's all, there are no, that everybody agrees. You're looking. Yeah. 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 Okay. That, that's, I, I that agree right. with you. Yeah. Yeah. There are a lot of good people in all these this places. This is my resting face. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of good people in all these places. I have family in North Carolina. They're just the best. Um, very, very liberal death penalty lawyers and such. And North Carolina is full of great progressive people. Um, just not quite enough. Not quite enough. Maybe not quite as focused on local organizing. Yeah. I mean, there's big money, obviously, behind turning their legislatures. But you know, a focus on local races is always something that, that anti-abortion people are really good at. Yes, and that's another thing you should do is you know, try to find out more about what goes on in the state legislature, including our own, which is still Republican, thank you, Andrew Cuomo, um, you know, and put some pressure on. Um, I think one thing our movement does is we're very focused at the federal level, and we're very unfocused at the state level. We really don't kind of take all that in, and most of the action on abortion rights takes place at the state level. Um, so that's another thing. You can adopt a state legislator in some, some distant state and make contact with them. 
Well, that brings us back to today being a new day after that election. Oh, there's still a chance, though. I mean, there's still an opportunity, many of which you've outlined, uh, to redirect and refocus. And I think we, you've made such a strong argument for why that should be the case. So thank you so much. Thank you, Erin. And thank really you, everyone, question. for your thank great Thank you for questions. the great questions.